Is there any business in different countries, UK, Russia, Scandinavia? Uh, the last few years, I'm more concerned about creating knowledge. Knowledge is the most valuable, the most sexist, and the most appealing and future-facing thing which you could think of. You know, I uh, wrote quite a few books. The last one, Literology, is considered uh, as one of the top 20 must-read books by Forbes. Wow, great. Uh, I'm on a sync as 50 reader. I'm one of the top, uh, in the top of sync 360. One of the number one global leading coaches by Marshall Goldsmith and sync 50 award. So I say just nice guy. I'm always saying to my wife, I'm not ideal. I'm not perfect, but I'm cool. So I'm trying to stay cool. Yeah. <laughs> you know. So welcome. Okay, I, I think Ambassador Tony. Yes. Ambassador Terry, welcome. Yes. Mrs. Eaton, welcome. Thank you. Excellent. How are you? Excellency Helena, welcome. I can see you. Thank you. Nice to see you. Nice All. to see you. So we're going to start now. It's, uh, it's already um, 1800. I think we, we should give people a couple of minutes to, 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 to join, join in. in. Okay. Yeah. Okay, Dr. Jackson, please, can you just just a brief uh, about you and what you've been doing? Okay, um, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, well, I've, I've spent probably 20, 25 years in, in the corporate setting, um, in leadership roles, in sales roles, marketing roles. Uh, in 2013, I started consulting business, JCG Consulting. We have a systems approach to uh, organizational development. Uh, with that, here lately, uh, given the COVID-19, I've been focused on healthcare and the coaching uh, and development of healthcare leaders, helping them thrive in the midst of all this uncertainty. Um, I am considered, I guess, I'm one of the Marshall Goldsmith 100 uh, coaches. Um, I'm, as, as Dr. O said, I'm at the, the top of... Uh, Thinkers, the 360, uh, was last November one, named one of the top 50 leading coaches in the world. Um, and so, you know, my passion is the, the true development of, of people. And like Dr. O, knowledge is what's most important. And, and helping others improve themselves is what I, what I live by. So that's just a little bit about me. Wow, great, great. Okay. We also have Ambassador Terry. Um, he's going to be on the next, the next uh, session we'll be having. Ambassador Terry. Wow. <laughs> You're welcome. So since you're going to be on our, our next uh, Quite our next session, uh, can you just tell us a bit about what you've been doing? I think it's oh. okay. I think we lost. Uh, we lost the Ambassador Terry. Ambassador Terry.
I'm trying to um, admit other people into the room. Uh, we have Princess Eaton from, from Canada. Hi, Princess. Hi, Dr. Lino. Uh, how are you? I'm good. Good how to are have you? you here. So what are your expectations Thank for today? Um, first one to connect. And second, I'd like to know more about the um, this session. I'd like to know what you have for us. So I'll be more into listening mode and learning mode. Okay, great. Okay, today, Dr. O will be speaking, uh, speaking on advanced leadership. advanced leadership and how to build your team. And how to build your team for the future. Mm -hmm. Hi, Helena. Hi, hi, Shirley. Wow, hi. Good evening, everyone. See, Good evening, Shirley. Nice. <laughs> oh wow i'm so excited to be here <laughs> so so helena uh, can you just tell us yes. what are your expectations for tonight what is my sorry your expectation for tonight okay so i am in the energy industry I manage one of the energy independence programs that I launched in Dubai for um, this year now. Portuguese entrepreneur, but currently in Dubai. So uh, what I am doing right now is shifting the, the mentality of how to provide energy, okay? In the energy industry, we are targeting to build local systems, off-grid systems, because this is the future, okay? And balancing the scales is all about this. So regardless of the market, and when we think about energy and renewables, usually people only think about solar energy. But the, the point here is that we have to assemble technologies together. There are several technologies in the market that we can use. So this is my main concern, okay? We have to okay. target to provide and to fulfill the U United Nations um, target for 2030, that is uh, access to energy, clean energy for everyone. A lot of African countries, as you know, has 50 to 70 to 80% of population without electricity. So we cannot do this uh, through the grid. We have to do this uh, building locally, local energy independence systems. So this is my main uh, goal. This is what I am doing now worldwide from Dubai. Uh, and I'm very happy to be here bet within us, between, uh, between you and to share all our knowledge and to learn from you and to cooperate with you as well. Thank you. Great, great. Uh, we have um, Dr. Cynthia Ashley, all the way from the United States. She does tune in. Dr. Cynthia, I don't know if you can hear me. You're welcome. A great a grace and peace to everyone. Uh, greetings from uh, America. I'm actually in one of the hot spots here, New York, um, in terms of the pandemic. But I just got on, so. Uh, I apologize if I'm a little, uh, you know, I haven't gotten on with everyone. But again, uh, thank you for the invite. I'm interested in learning more about what you plan to share on this platform. Uh, I will start my video. Let's see if I can. Okay. <laughs> oh, there it is. Okay. Um, yeah, I, um, I, I, you know, I'm looking forward to what this platform has to offer in the way of um, branding, I guess, uh, from what I yeah. understand. And again, thank you, uh, Ambassador Dr. Eno, and also uh, Hillary. God bless you. It's good God to bless you. Bless you. God bless you. 
And I pray that everyone is safe um, and that your families are safe and that you continue to continue to move forward because it's important that we keep moving forward. We keep progressing it despite uh, what it may appear to be or what it may feel like. We have to continue to move forward by faith meaning we don't go by what we see. We go by, um, you know, how we are led. And the more that we depend on our inward ability to be more uh, led by our greater inside, because inside that's what really counts, you know, our spiritual acumen and how we're led. Because for me, and I speak for me, uh, it's important because if I don't tap into the greater that's within me, then there will be a lot to contend with on the outside. So we don't want the outside to get on the inside, but we want our inside to project and to be that light so we can continue to grow and, and glow <laughs> and do what we need to do. Great, great. Thank you so much, Dr. Cynthia. Oh, we have Shelly Hills here. Shelly Hughes is also one of our partners. We'd just like her to tell us what she's been up to. Good evening, and everyone. And our expectations for tonight. Okay, thank you very much, um, my brother. You know, we are beyond partners, so um, thank you very much. It's amazing to see Dr. Terence Jackson, Dr. Oleg, and everyone else. Um, so I'm looking to um, learn from the thought, thought leadership of our, our guest speakers here tonight. Um, I'm part of the team, so I wouldn't want to share so much of what I do. Maybe beyond this, I could be found on LinkedIn at Shirley Hills, so we can always catch up there so that we do not waste much more time than we already have. Okay. So okay, great. I'm looking forward to learning and um, expanding my knowledge. And of course, collaborating. I see a lot of um, interesting personalities here. Yeah, we have um, uh, Princess, our uh, Royal Highness, Princess Murnadi, she just joined us all the way from the United States of America. Your Royal Highness, I don't know if you can hear us. With this, with this man. I think we should okay, okay, so let's, let's start the meeting. Okay, um, I, I, I believe we should start. Dr. O, um, I'm, I'm going to- Okay, I can see. hear you. Now. Yeah. You can hear me. Okay, thank you. Okay, let's start. Yeah, Dr. O, I think we should start. Yeah. Okay. Hi to all. So we should talk today about something exciting. A good leader is about his team and the people cross. But if you consider yourself as a leader, I would ask you a simple question. What your team, your people achieved under your leadership? Write down it in a chat box or, or take a note for yourself. What you could say about achievements of your people. And I would ask you to write three achievements actually that should be announced in front of a team and every team member should be praised. How easy would you think? Can you write something in the chat box whilst we talk about this? This is all about what a good leader does. He builds people up. And the best thing you could do or your company could go for is for people working in the company. Technologists, process, everything could be copied very easily. People are unique. People that treat it well and have the freedom to innovate will be the ones who will be pushing existing technologies further and further and invent new ones. T 
keep down, we all know this. And the greater tales, all the great tales from our childhood and adulthood are about people and them overcoming challenges. Even like now, we're overcoming the challenge of the COVID. Argonauts recovered the golden fleece. King Arthur holding back the Saxons. In real history, the Spartans held back the Persians. The Americans defeated British. So it's no different in business. All successful strategies are built on people and their ability to perform. I know one thing from my experience. People become giants in a team if a leader makes everything for people grows. In this sense, we could ask a simple question. Why people need leaders? Are they stupid enough not to go into some kind of a right direction? No. First of all, people need leaders qualities to complement their own qualities and become better. Therefore, they're following strong leaders and they're gathering together around a strong leader. And so one of the main qualities is ability to enhance the human touch in relationships in this team and with customers. A human touch and presence would never lose its appeal and importance. Like now we gather together from different countries. It demands staying firm on the basics of a human interaction. We still need engaging chats by a water cooler or a coffee machine, as always. The same in terms of customer care, where people want to feel physical and psychological connection, real human connection between us. As I'm saying at these days, social distancing does not mean being disconnected. It is important to stay connected. Teams, not crowds, win battles. Uh, for recently, I had a chat with a venture capitalist about the latest trends in the startups investing. And he said to me, look, we are not investing just into a product today. We invest into the team which is capable of creating unique products. So the team has become more important from a capitalization viewpoint than a product itself. I have managed a number of businesses in different countries myself. And you know, one of the imp most important lessons I have learned that the real problems are not things that keep me busy or worried or afraid of losing money or something. Real problems uh, whatever distances a company from its customers or a leader from his people. The greater the inner problem, the greater the divide. So can you imagine a leader staying outside from his team? That would be something nonsensical, unreal. Why we create team, teams or teams? We don't need to hunt the mammoths anymore. We need teams to win people, minds and hearts. Today we could look under the bonnet, for instance, of Mercedes AMG. And it's a personal play of the engineer who assembled the engine. We could connect with him, chat with him, discuss everything about engines, even meet with him. This is a human touch of an engineer who represents a strong team and he takes a responsibility on behalf of a whole team. And this is a great representation of a great teamwork. At the same time, he is teaming with the customer or client. Hey, questions comes. And if you could do a place right down this answer to a simple question. How much every member of your team 
knows about your customer needs. The reason behind this question is very simple. If your team members are not aware of customer needs, there is no reason for them to fight for customers. Uh, yeah, do a clear yeah. and honest yeah. evaluation. Yeah. If your team has a fake understanding of customers and their needs, then it is crowd. It's not, not an army. You know, it's not a proper crew. Please, please. Oops. Because can, some, can you switch off your microphones, please? Would you yes, be so please. kind? Please switch off your mic. Okay. I have to delete you, madam. Sorry, so, leadership act actions means solving inefficiencies in the processes of human interactions. Like now, we must do something to keep the interaction going. So, it is important to make a difference for people every day and giving people a clear direction with clear goals. This is difficult for many. And every leader should consider three critical factors which may affect effective team engagement. Influence, connecting people and overcoming resistance. Let's look at it. Influence. If a leader doesn't give a direction, he's blind and makes his team blind. So he must have a vision. But a vision is a gift that must be multiplied. And the ability to multiply that gift strongly depends on the leader's ability to influence. And the greater the vision, the greater the demand for strong and far-reaching influence. So there is no leadership without the ability to influence and positively impact people, to inspire people, to engage in action beyond themselves. And influence is very interesting factor itself. It's a manageable power. So, and a six points could be stated about it. First of all, the strength of influence is, de is defined by the energy of a leader who pours, that he pours into people and how they become charged with confidence, positivity, enthusiasm. He could imagine a weak leader who is trying to tell people, oh, we should go fast or we should be strong if he's not strong himself. There is no such thing as a remote influence. A leader influence depends on his closeness to people. Influence is about being with people, walking them to the destination and not pointing in a direction. A leader become influential and powerful by being simple. Influence is a matter of simplicity. It is difficult to transmit something complicated to people and get a feedback or response. Influence greatly depends on the leader's warmness, benevolence, insightfulness, authenticity, and many other factors of a being proper human. Influence is about building a base of believers and supporters. If we can build it, great. But no one could achieve something huge on his own. We all know this. But influence can't depend on old methods and achievements. It must be consistent in its cross itself. So it must be renewed, revitalized all the time. Leaders connect people. This is critical. They're not standing up by their own. They connect people. Think of this simple slogan. 
this is one of the main leaders role in creating the team. Acting means merging people and being diligent in helping employees and customers to become happy and mutually satisfied. The leader acts as an architect of the for an organization building as a collective of mutually affected people. So the leader takes all the pressure of that construct and connecting and supporting different elements of that structure. And connecting people allows everyone involved to equally access to all available resources, such as competences, qualities, knowledge, growing potentials, everything that needed to, to reach new heights in personal and professional growth. The, great, the greatest value which leader could in, infuse his team is to produce a well-connected people. That is critical. People are not born with advanced skills, how to necessarily, to, how to unite together or how to be together. None of us. Plus modern social technologies, they, in fact, they, they have quite a, a negative side effects in terms of disconnecting people when they use inappropriately. So people need to be coached by their leaders, how to interact effectively, how to complement each other and how to enhance their social qualities. We're all facing change. We're all part of the change. So, but the change is never smooth. Therefore, leadership is about overcoming resistance every day. And this is all right. The problem is getting rid of something old and dated, never easy, right? And ability to overcome resistance depends greatly on the extent a leader can ignore those odds, stupidity, naysayers in the, when, in the way to implementing change. It demands a great deal of patience, focus, persistence, and a mastery in sensing people's needs. Overcoming resistance and implementing change also demands a perfect sense of timing. You know, if you're slow, if you, it's one thing, but if you're implementing change too quickly, it leads to forcing people to change before they are ready. In this case, people blindly follow instructions and they're burning their doubts, but these doubts will pop up again on a surface and making things worse. Spending too much time on implementing change allows to redevelop. So you must be perfect a mastery in timing and find right arguments to break down the old paradigms which are non-relevant, stagnant. Actually, it's not a leader's doubts in most cases. The great part of engagement is about challenging people's inner doubts and helping them out of their mental bubbles. So, and all great leaders are very good at this. What leaders could do today to maintain a strong team and help to elevate their teams to the next level of success? Leadership is a team sport, we all know that. Help your people to grow and they will make you a better leader. Think again, it's logical because I am grow people and I grow with them. They're helping me. No one would do more than the leader. So if you want your people to do more, you must do more yourself. In this sense, it is very useful to take notes actually daily, how I have helped my people to grow, how you helped your people grow and change. It's also another pattern, another dimension of it. But let's go, go into 
practical side of this story. What are the secret elements which are important to consider when you're creating a strong team? There are three of them. Overlapping roles, making employees mutual investors, and turning culture and team into action. First is about overlapping uh, roles. Many teams face a very serious problem. People can't see much beyond their desks. They act like being in cocoon, but how to break it? Let's look at their roles, not job descriptions, because roles define how we support each other and customers. <laughs> For instance, my role for the team and, and customers defines what value I create for others. Job description doesn't show that. Team is a combination of, of a strong team, is a combination of overlapping roles, and it's not a bunch of mere job descriptions. So it's not pieces of paper which you sign in front of HR officer. It's your understanding of the role for the organization, for the company, for customers, for colleagues, for yourself. Yes, job descriptions are necessary, but it, it restricts an employee vision of the inner life of organization as one single body. We need employees to, and the team members to act and think in, outside of their mental boxes and be together with a team instead of being isolated. To start, I would ask you to write, to do a simple exercise and, and write in about 10, 12 sentences, answers to five questions. And the first question is, what is my role for the organization? What is my role for the organization? The second question would be, what is my role for colleagues and peers from all other departments? Even for colleagues in a very remote branches. Helena just been talking that she is Portuguese working in Arab Emirates and concern, her main concern is a energy for Africa. So the surely dispersed team. What is my role in satisfying customer? Even if you're not working with customers directly. What is my role for subordinates and app or apprentices? What is my role for senior managers or shareholders or investors? When you see that, pattern, you will get a fully 360 degrees understanding of your role. And so ask your top management to do the same task and then ask your employees to perform the same exercise. It's not as simple, but it's not as difficult. The aim is to ingrain in employees a clear and meaningful understanding of who they are within the organization. This will allow a clear understanding of their roles and extended responsibilities. And it will help your people to see far beyond their desks. I'd say they, the reason that it's called overlapping, they already not just would be distance or standing shoulder to shoulder, they would be hugging each other. Because all the roles are overlapped. It's simple. A strong team, a strong culture is not about you. It is not about me. It is about what we do for others, right? And how we support each other, how we complement each other with our competences and emotions, how we help to reveal each other greatness. This is critical. This demands everyday effort in strengthening relationships, effort in supporting people and caring for them. 
This demands investment in a form of clear contribution for the growth of others. We grow by helping others. Encouragement, empathy, support, positivity. All inputs, inputs are valuable all addressed in the right direction and affect each other. But how to become an effective people investor? There is simple, tremendous power behind the wisdom of reciprocity. Help others and expect a help in return. Listen to what people need and share with them what, they, what you have or know. Be an example of supporting others as a leader. It pays back enormously. You know, physical support is important, but what we learned that today we need much more support in helping each other in, in the cross. Your colleagues, customers, partners need your encouraging words, your real empathy, which is sympathy with effort. We all need help with self-awareness, clarifying and direction for growth, encouragement on something we do well and many other things. Again, do a simple task. Write down answers to two simple questions. You will be surprised. How much do you know about your colleagues' achievements in the last year? or your subordinates achievements in the, over the last year. And the second question, how did you praise them and supported them in these achievements? And ask your team to do the same. The result will speak for itself. I got experience. I was consulting quite a serious IT company and a 16 top VPs, you know, sat together around the table. They're all friendly. They all love each other. And then when they came with these two questions, they start almost crying because appears they don't know much about each other. And so they're not supporting each other. Can we say that they are a strong team? No. The team is in mutual support and helping each other to become better. You're investing yourself in other people. What's important to consider? Let's look at the teams from different angle. Great team is a verb. It's a verb of dynamic acting. And a leader is a pace setter. He or she actually do things, not just talk. And what I have found on average, a medium-sized company is losing about six to ten million dollars per year on meaningless meetings. Don't waste your time on the chip talks. <laughs> Start doing real things, please. Create a checklist of actions. What do you have done to strengthen the team today in real terms? What have you done to set a pace for others to act? What restricts you and your team from acting as one force? And eventually, <laughs> answering these three questions it will become a strong habit within a month or so, and you probably don't need it to do it anymore after that, because you already will set a, a certain pace. You know, tomorrow, team competence and quality should be nurtured by you today as if you think about the future. And how we care for people today will reflect the result and the people development tomorrow. Let's think of a simple term. For what modern leaders pay today? A modern leader is paid to develop people to secure success in the present and in the future. Sounds quite obvious, okay. Today, we are not really competing against competitors, but against your past self. 
and the leader who in charge of developing uh, is in charge of developing such metaphysical resources as trust, teamwork, professionalism, innovation, accountability, and shared vision. This is all a metaphysical resources because those resources are generated within a human interaction. You can't buy them. You must generate them. These assets or a source of metaphysicals, they are actually define the productivity and effectiveness of a team interaction. It, very interesting, I have found that employees are more desperate to build strong team than their leaders because leaders look at it more from pragmatic side. Oh, I need a strong team to achieve good result. But people also need that emotional closeness. They want to feel being in a family while they're at office. They want to be part of something big and bigger than themselves and something very important, not just a cog in a machine. So, but they need your knowledge how to be together and how to generate these critical resources. You must help them. It is a challenge and achievement. It wouldn't be giving you for granted. So you must infuse your team with confidence, courage, and excellence. Think of a simple point, confidence. If somebody non-confident, or not confident, who would be attracted? The same non-confident person. So you wouldn't get far. Confidence means defeating yourself over and over again. It means defeating your fears and your tendency to procrastinate. This is not possible in the long term if you're only doing it for yourself. You always could give you a slack. The good leader must build himself for others, so for his team, and not just for himself or even to defeat the, or I would be stronger than my competitor. Nothing like that. Confidence comes when one is sure that he or she fulfills and even surpasses his commitment to teammates. The leader must be credible, confident, and exhibiting it in consistency in words, actions, and deeds. It's more important than professional competence. People are quite professional, or even more professional than a leader, which is, happens quite often. But they need this consistency. This is, more imp uh, this is very important. But what is more important is attention to people. Attention to people affect the leader's credibility. Le people want a leader to be authentic, real, you know. Leader must grow in the excellency because what does it mean leading a team? It's purely psychological work, high pressure psychological work. And leaders lead by example and they're sharing their energy with people. They build own self for others. Le you know, I, I'm becoming, I must become better to serve others better. That would allow my team to be better. No one is perfect, that's for sure. But growing that inner excellency is a leader's responsibility. As a leader develops, he or she become better and better in fighting doubts, keeping this inner spirit up, and learn from mistakes, which is great. And leader must be mentally flexible because flexibility is a mark of well-trained mind. If a leader ready to admit mistakes, the team would go for him everywhere. 
courage is sinking. How critical is it? Courage is contagious. The more courage we display in advancing vision, the more we will be, the more will inspire others. Elitic courage is encourages engagement from others in the organization. So, which is, it's a great magnet itself. But fear is always, is also contagious. Fearful leaders cast fear and doubts on their people, creating a company which is fearful and rigged and outdated. Courage leads to engagement and mutual encouragement. And leaders' personal courage is important. But what's important, the team courage is more important, I would say, in this way. Because success depends on a team courage. And a leader can't move further, can't move further than his team. So the ability to inspire people is worth a fortune. It's everything. You know, just to conclude this discussion, I want to share something I learned hard way. Team grown and trained to will to win will win. Teams that don't know how success look like tend to fail. So think, do you breed winners or losers? If you breed winners, start rolling out the red carpet for your teams now. You know, they will do everything to step on it. So this is more or less about the team's most critical points. You could find more material in my latest book, Leaderology. You could connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm always sharing some kind of a tips and suggestions. Or you could sign up to my website and I'm publishing quite regularly articles, blog posts, different material, which could be of a great help to you. And thank you very much. Please ask your questions. Thank you, Dr. O. Uh, that was very exciting. Uh, we'll, we'll be taking some, some questions. Uh, please, let's try and do it orderly. Um, I'll, I'll leave the floor open. So if you have a question, please just indicate, and then we'll unmute you so you can talk. Thank you. OK, Josiah wants to ask a question. So uh, we're unmuting Josiah. Josiah. Okay, can I go on? You can go on. Can I go, go on? on? Yeah. Okay, so um, thank you, thank you very much. I think this, this is this is very welcome and very inciting, inciting uh, uh, topic you just you just talked about. My question is about uh, a team member. If you have a team, a team of, um, of staff, and you have a team member who's very difficult. As a matter of fact, uh, every member of the team is in sync except this particular one individual. And uh, of course, the individual has certain skills and talent that you cannot do without, that you need in that team. So it is not easy to just get rid of him from the team. But he, his personality is such that is is very difficult and it tends to always drag the team back with regards to wanting the team to always do his bidding. How do you and and deal with such the entire thing? Everyone, every person, me, you, everyone wants to be feel part of something big and important. At the same time, you want to feel, and I want to feel, being part of something really cozy like a small family because we're all unique but we want to be part as or playing a role for something very important if you have few kids would you treat them in the same way no they're still yours and you treat them differently in terms of you giving them you recognizing their different qualities this Therefore, you're looking not at job description, but you're looking at their roles. 
because their roles reveal or a good articulated role allow them to reveal their qualities, best qualities. If they will find their place in that team, you wouldn't need to manage them separately because they already found their place in that team. Okay, I, Josiah, I hope, I hope he has been able to answer your question. Um, no, uh, okay. Okay, so um, if, if you have, uh, someone else has any other question, want to ask him, please indicate as usual, uh, the, once you do that, we'll mute you. Okay, Ravna has a question. Hi, Dr. Oleg. I Hi, have Elisa. a question. I think we've met on LinkedIn a few times, but my question is, do you think spirituality, I think Dr. Cynthia mentioned this also, do you think spirituality in terms of your energy that you have to give to people, like you nicely said, plays a role in becoming a good leader also? It's ma because about managing your energy up and down, and when you're from a spiritual self, you actually learn to show your confidence and courageousness more. I would be careful talking about religious spirituality. No, no, I do, I do not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean, understand. Definitely this. not a spirit. Definitely yeah, not yeah, religious. Yeah. But yeah. what I strongly believe that if you're a good leader, you must believe in something greater than yourself mm -hmm. because then you otherwise there is no place for humility you would be thinking only about yourself and your personal ambitions and surely not about team mm. and you would be having nothing to share with your people mm. but if you think about hey I need to be better with four people you will get this energy from inside and you could call it spirituality because that's a difference that you make within you for mm -hmm. others. Yep. Thank you. Great. Okay. Uh, thank you. That was great. Uh, <laughs> I, I was worried a bit, well, you know, when it comes to spirituality, you have to be, able, you have to be very technical when you're answering such a question. And I'm very impressed with Dr. O. That was quite, that's, that's very interesting. Yeah. So um, do we have, uh, I'm sure we have more questions. Yeah. Um, um, Godsville or Kichiko has a question. Yeah. Godsville, go ahead. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone, for being part of this um, um Sir Oleg, in the talking point of this meeting, please. Uh, you need to be more audible. Yeah, please. Godsville, please okay. be more audible. We can't hear you. Okay. Okay, sir. In the starting point of this meeting, uh, I only made mention of helping people grow when you're part of a team. Now, if you help people grow, you grow yourself. But what is the case? What will happen when people in the same team as you are does not give you the opportunity to express yourself in such a way that you can help the team move forward? Uh, Dr. Ina, can you repeat the, this question, uh, please? Because I hardly heard the question. Can you? Yeah, God's will, God's will, you are not, uh, I couldn't hear what you were saying. I don't oh, think, uh, if, you, if you could be more audible, please, so we can all hear your question. Okay. My question is this. Um, in the starting point of this meeting, I only made helping people grow in your team. Now, my question is this. If you are part of a team and you have um, ideas, creative ideas that you can help um, the group, um, the team to grow, and the part and your team does not want you to express yourself in such a way that you can help them move forward, what would you do in such um, a situation? I would run away from such team. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously. Obviously. They are killing me. Why I should be with them? Or in another instance, you cooked something nice and you brought it to people and say, people, take it, please. And they're ignoring it. 
Would you go for them again and again and again? No. You'll go to others. Find a better place. Very correct. Okay. So do Should we, have, we do continue have, do to have, the second part? Yeah, let's make one more question um, before we continue. If, you, if there's any more question, just one more question. Uh, if, if, if not, we'll continue, we want to take the second part. Okay, all right, so let's take the second part. Okay. Uh, uh, we've been thinking about about Dr. O. Yes. Uh, there are some people on the on the waiting room trying to get in. Yeah, okay. So chef, yeah, because you are the host. Uh huh. Yeah, we're having difficulty allowing people in. So please just okay. get them in. Welcome. Great. <laughs> are you charging for tickets? Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, <laughs> right. Yes. Okay. Dr. Okay. Wall, please, before you start, hold on. Um, Carlo Shudi, um, please, can you mute your microphone? Your microphone, please. Carlo Shudi, please, can you mute your microphone? Oh, it's done very simple. Thank you. I will switch it off. Aha, uh -huh. thank you. Aha. Uh -huh. <coughs> okay, uh, Dr. Ho, before, Dr. Ho, before you start in... Um, We've so been thinking about or uh, discussing with Dr. Hillary. Oh, sorry, sorry. I just wanted to say that we, we um, while you were um, on your first session, we had some, some, uh, some of our friends, also partners that came in. We have Daniel. Daniel is also in uh, New York. Um, we have um, Carl Oshudi. We have John Spence. Mm -hmm. uh, we have Yemi Ajibade also from, I think, from Lagos. Yeah. Yemi Ajibade from Lagos, yeah. So I just want to acknowledge them, uh, you know, before you, before you start your second session. So please, you can, you can go on now. Thank you. You see, good talk attracts small people. Yeah, which is important. <laughs> so, one of the questions was when we discussed with Dr. Hillary this masterclass, what would be important topic to talk about? And it came to the point that it is critical to talk about empathy, leadership or leaders' empathy. So, what empathy is? It's a sympathy with effort. But in this sense, what effort means, right? We quite know about sympathy, but what about effort? We're quite doubtful. The most important thing for leaders is to stay focused on the employees and care for them. And the highest purpose of leadership is to act for people, together with people, and for their needs. We have a problem. We expect engagement without giving much back to people. We hardly talk about care for people, but we expect them to take care for the company. We expect empathy without exhibiting a real empathy from leaders and from organizations. This is quite difficult at certain points because it's unfair. This is unfair and wouldn't get any business far in its development. While well, sounds simple, care is one of the most puzzling issue for leaders in terms, and people as well, in terms of what to do, what to expect. But actually without care, we can't move far. And I would ask you to think for a moment how clearly you can define what kind of care you expect from your company. What keep you warm and protected? Isn't easy? No. 
if we would, I would ask you to answer this question within like 15, 30 seconds or even a minute, you would be struggling. It's a normal for all of us. It's not as people as we assume, for all people. Care for people in their future is not a box of biscuits or other perks offered in the offices. It's not care. Care is how company help people grow and feel valued. Care is a commodity. The most valuable commodity that a company offers its employees over and above a wage. People judge the company based on how it cares for them. And em employees will engage only if the company is fully engaged in them. If somebody is not worried about me, why should be worried about him? This is normal. If no care exists in, you know, relations with employees, then no engagement can be expected in return. So if people think of their loyalty as being a matter of a price, they will only to perform to the level they think their pay is worth. You know, the company is a nursery for talents, competence, and quality. But how it looks like? And I will talk about five elements of care, which are critical. Leaders involvement, care for the future, emotional comfort, physical comfort, and safety. Leaders involvement. The real nature of the company is seen in its ability to care for people. This must be more than words. Acting effectively for people means knowing what people need and supporting them in their desires. And how much do we know about people? Begins with engaging interaction from which we know and learn about people. And interesting thing that a few minutes of a genuine interaction are forced years of a formal communication. So make every minute worth a year. So being connected and involved means partnering with employees on a full range of the issues which are important for human life. Real involvement reveals real empathy, leaders' empathy. How I could express empathy to people if I don't talk to them? How much do I know about you people? This simple question. Can you answer this? Learn about people, talk with them. And it's you're ready, people will feel cared. That somebody's thinking about them. It's like coming back home from the long office hours and your wife is either asking how are you and how is your day or not asking. That's the difference. Everything we do, we do for the future. We talk now to gain the knowledge for the future, not for the past. So the one of the main concerns uh, of care is to think and act. How to position people in a best possible version of the future. When, I'm t when I take care of someone's professional growth, I actually am securing his future and enhancing his value on a job market. I guarantee his of hands, all of us, our professional competences to an employer expecting support and professional personal growth in return, which is fair. Case personal, you know, just reverting back to one of these questions which we have a few minutes ago, case personal. So everyone in a company is different. But if you know how to care about different people, it becomes a norm. 
you know, you taking people on their strengths and finding a joy in giving people what they need for their growth. If they grow, they will make your company stronger. In real sense, I believe you and every person tend to ask, how do I benefit from working for a given company? How does it help me to be more valued now and in the future? Because no one wants to turn back and say, I work for a dodgy company, so I don't even want to put it on my CV. And how often do you ask yourself this question? This is about a care for the future. Emotional comfort. It's a very important element because the inner state of employees, their psychological and mental comfort demands care. It is defined by the openness of, of the inner climate in the company, respect, consistency of leadership, and ease of interaction at all levels. Caring for employees' emotional comfort celebrates people and their inner richness they bring to the company. But ruining positive emotions and insulting employees is far too common in modern offices. Never forget that no salary can cover the loss of dignity and confidence that results from a negative culture. You know, culture and that team environment is only perfect to extent that how people feel themselves in it. How we can see this? If we consider culture as energy that then metaphorically speaking, we can say that its positivity can be defined by the number of smiles in the office every working day. Smiles connect people. Smiles make communication easy and more effective. If we think of organization performance in a sum of individual inputs, then we could say that every smile is a sign of high individual performance. As a result, it comes to millions in profit and sustainable growth. So if you want the people to smile today, then you should take care of their positive emotions yesterday. Let the employees smile today and they would, when they're leaving your office, and they will smile tomorrow. You will see an incredible surplus in outcome very soon. And of course, more enthusiastic people. They feel cared and comfortable. How many smiles you have sparked today? Can you say? Can you take a note? How many smiles have you sparked today on the people's faces? That's a result. Physical comfort. Physical comfort is important for everyone. Enough light, minimal distraction, feeling comfortable, a chance to relax, good location, whatever. A dodgy workplace never inspires anyone. No one will be productive and inclined to work in an uncomfortable, packed and noisy office. It's unreal. The first thing that comes to the minds of employees is that the company saves money on them for a fatter profit. But the people, not mushrooms, who are kept in the dark and fed with a compost. It's unfair. We face too much stress at workplaces, and so it causes enough problems. We don't need to make this problem even greater. So if you're saving dollars on a physical comfort, you're losing thousands and millions on employees' health, well-being, and engagement. Because people think that you are saving on them. You're not caring for them. I was at sea for a couple of years on a fishing boat in the North Atlantic myself. Ages ago, that was a great experience. This is one of the 
10 deadliest professions. You might have seen it on the discovery program, The Deadliest Catch. Quite a funny business. At sea, no one is questioning the importance of safety. We all want to be home safe and in one piece. As safety is an element of active care, you know, because it shows professionalism in people management and care for them. High attention to safety shows that the company wouldn't risk the employee's life or well-being for the sake of quick gain. You know, as one of the, my friends is a CFO of one of the largest energy companies said to me, a company which scores best on safety also scores best on performance. And it is relevant to every industry, you know, not only to those high risk professions. I would wrap it up in a practical way. Empathy shows its greatness in its functionality through the real care for people. The higher the degree of care, then the higher employees engagement will be. And how to do it? You know, you must tell people clearly what the company is prepared to do for them, beyond the biscuits, that's for sure. Otherwise, they will be imagining something unrealistic and non-important. And your competitors will headhunt them for a better biscuits and a gym ticket because people don't know how it's articulated. And I will tell you something, don't forget. Simulated care causes simulated engagement. Let's do a very simple, but very practical exercise. Take a note, when you have time, write down how you as a leader care for your people and how employees consider this. Five elements, involvement, care for the future, emotional comfort, physical comfort, and safety. Evaluate a level of care in your organization from a scale from zero to 10. Zero is no care and 10 is all done in the best manner. And use these five elements and mark your answers. The best mark, of course, is 50. And if you have 35 or higher, then it looks positive and future ready. Uh, just need some kind of improvement. This is all right, but you're on the right track. If less than 35, ooh, you're in the red zone. So, but it's a good thing in terms because you have a huge potential to change the people's lives and your company in a good way. Everything in your hands in this sense. So empathy stands on elaborating meaning of human engagement. And so we must talk about engagement. It's built on the leader's empathy. And I'll start with a simple point, respect. You know, respect is critical for success. Even two and a half thousand years ago, Sun Tzu stated, regard your soldiers as your children and they will follow you into the deepest valley. Look at them as your own beloved sons and they will stand by you unto death, even unto death, yeah, even unto death. Nothing has changed. Respect is needed if we want employees to respect the company, be loyal and feel obliged to work to their full potential. However, respect is a two-way street. It must be clearly articulated, expressed and clearly addressed to every person in the company, not once, but ever so often. Don't expect people to assume that they are respected without you saying so. Respect like love demands constant feedback with relevant words and signals. You know, uh, one of my Norwegian colleagues called me another day with an interesting story. And she called me and said, look, you can't imagine. I know a Norwegian guy who has been married to a Brazilian woman for three years. 
And one day, this Brazilian woman came to his husband, uh, husband and said, quite uh, being desperate to know about their relationships and why, and asking why he never tells her that he loves her. He loves her. And this poor Norwegian guy responded, I said that I love you when we got married three years ago, and I haven't changed my opinion since. <laughs> you know, you could imagine what these uh, people feel like if you're not telling them that you love them and respect them. They're in the same situation as this Brazilian woman. They don't need to assume. You must express it. So a few words of respect changing a lot. It might be a whole world for somebody. It will cost you nothing, but it makes a whole lot of difference. Let's look at job satisfaction and involvement. It's a reflection of your empathy. But job satisfaction is not a standalone element. It's, it consists of four components. The first one is, of course, financial reward. Fair pay is a must. But payment is assumed to be fair as soon as you are within the, or staying within a market trend. You're all right with that. But second component lies in the area of consistent employee growth. This is a normal human desire that builds up self-confidence and satisfaction for the future. Because in the back of our minds, we all understand that if we are not growing, we are falling behind. The third element is very interesting. People feel involved if they have a chance to make something better. It just returning to one of these questions, how I would express my creativity and I am ignored. So you can't change much leave this company because there no empathy towards you. Even when, you know, when you do some kind of a routine and boring war, you must understand why. And you, the fourth element, you must feel like an important part of something really valuable, something really great. You're not a replaceable part and the people as well. So in simple words, the opportunity to change something for the good while being a valuable part of something important makes an incredible difference. We all strive by the personal preparedness for change. You know, I lived for many years in the Arctic where all four seasons can be experienced in one summer day. Snow, rain, sun, wind, everything. And imagine the situation early morning, uh, about seven o'clock in the morning, and we're coming back from a night of fishing because of day's uh, night sun. Not as cold, about three, five degrees, and rain with snow and people are waiting for the bus. And people mainly in warm coats and jackets, but there are always few in t-shirts. And we used to say they're the luckiest ones whose, whose night was long and entertaining. Uh, but this illustrates an important point. We are more able to withstand adversity if, we're, if our outlook is positive. Change is successful and supported if employees have positive experience from previous changes or supported by positive experience of those who have gone through a similar process before. It comes as a result of learning or from a variety of experiences of different practices. In other words, preparedness for change becomes a habit, a second language. Therefore, encourage your people give them opportunity to grow, praise their, their accomplishments, and their preparedness for change will be at the highest level. 
loyalty. We actually mentioned about loyalty a few minutes before, but what does it mean being loyal? Being loyal means being devoted to a company while acknowledging it, its problems and mistakes. Because no company is perfect or ideal. Loyalty is not a gift, it's something to be gained. It is a hard-won relationships between a company and employee. And today, the center of gravity has shifted from employer to employee, so to you. And the understanding of loyalty has also evolved, uh, reflecting authenticity of caring and moving beyond mere reciprocity of company employee relationships. In practical terms, a loyal employee is 1.6 times more productive than one who is not loyal. So think for a moment, would you feel a difference if 80-90% of employees were loyal of your employees? It's a huge difference. And also, it's a very interesting moment, but it's very real that loyalty assumes non-defensive dialogue between a company and employees. And so it's better understanding, stronger attachment to each other, higher respect, and as a result, all grow. But the problem is that far too often leaders kill loyalty and engagement by emphasizing their position of power over others. This is not an empathy for sure. Ah, creativity. I love the question of this gentleman. Creativity means finding new forms of expressing love and care to customers to colleagues that allow greater understanding of the people needs and response to it. Negative culture is a culture of thousand no's. And where positive culture aims to respond yes to new ideas. And if the company doesn't welcome creativity, it becomes blind and helpless. And so, as a leaders, I want to ask you a question, very simple. How would you deal with your next bold idea that coming from your employees or colleagues? It might change your status quo, or it might change uh, the way how do you serve customers. So, it's critical to ask this question all the time, where I support creativity or I'm resisting to it. How important responsibility? I'm, I demonstrate my empathy by being responsible for what I do for people. It's a hallmark of authenticity. And of course, we all know that high level of responsibility means high quality. So, but what is interesting, responsible people will never harm organization because they always care about the company reputation. They don't give empty promises. This is also a sign of responsible, being responsible. Share affection and support. In business, we work together, grow together, we lose together, and we win together. Yes, physical support is still important. Can you pass me the catalog or open a window? Nice, cool. But we need emotional and psychological support much more than a physical support. And shared affection and support is the essence of engagement. It's the essence of empathy. You know, 
think of a self-confidence. A confident person is a person who is not hindered by artificial limits, not sitting in a glass box. He knows well his capacity and potentials, and we all need this. So we simply need encouraging words when facing some kind of a challenging We need fair evaluation of our ideas. We need fair evaluation of our qualities and competences. Actually, I wrote my first book because my friends and colleagues pushed me to write it. And I'm grateful to them as I never considered myself that I have such kind of a talent to do, to write books or write articles. I even refused to accept it, but eventually it changed my life. And so I'm focusing now on helping others to optimize their potential. And employees wouldn't be fully engaged without, high, without being highly motivated. They're not going to ex expand their effort unless they have a reason to expect results and support and empathy from leaders. People prepare to engage if they believe that their leaders care for them, empathize them and add new meanings to their lives. What does it mean new meanings? We have, we have talked about respect, creativity, job satisfaction, loyalty. An interesting fact is those taken for granted, often taken for granted criteria must be strengthened by adding new meanings all the time. So do a simple task, write down how you see and define meanings of engagement and your care for your people and discuss this with your team. Ask your people to contribute to this discussion with their thoughts and you will show your empathy. You will make a good steps towards your people and you will get your people engaged. You will see you being engaged. So the result would be incredible. So thank you very much. You, as I mentioned, you could read more in my leaderology. Connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm happy to chat. Or sign up to my newsletters on my website, olekkanavalov.com. Thank you very much. And please ask your questions. That's all. You know, we, uh, yes. we, didn't tell you, we didn't tell you when we started. We made you the host. So a lot of people are waiting to get back in. So okay. a lot of people are waiting. And I wouldn't want to interrupt you when you were talking, but we have people. Oh, yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. So if you check. Uh -huh. Okay. But if you have questions, please ask. So if, if, you, if, um, if you have a question, just signify so that we can unlock, we can unlock uh, your, or mute you so you can yeah. ask this. Yeah, you could unmute yourself and ask your question. Okay. Hi. Oh, yes, John. Yes. How are you, my friend? Thank you. <laughs> um, talk to me about how do you um, maintain a strong culture when all of us are working from different places virtually? It, it's easier to show appreciation and affection and things like that when you're face to face, but when you've got your team spread out, let's say for some of us all over the world, how do you keep your organizational culture strong? I actually had a, uh, exactly the same case in one of the companies with a few branches. And actually they gone into stage, I would call almost a cold war, civil war, because one branch was fighting against each other, you know, uh, others, other branches. And it was horrible. And of course, blaming other branches. 
for no reason. That means it's a pure leader's fault who didn't give them a direction and they don't have any shared vision. So they feel separated and therefore they've been considering their colleagues from other branches as some kind of a strangers or even who are trying to conquer their territories. And we discussed in the first part of this conversation about the importance of overlapping roles. If they, those people don't understand how their roles overlapped, they wouldn't get far. Therefore, it's important to put people together by showing them how important they are for each other in achieving that goal, which is clearly set. That would bring people together. Thank you, John. Thank you, all. Thank you. Thank you, John. You want to ask one more? You want to ask another question? Okay. Um, we have we have Karima. Karima, um, she is the president of the International Center for Diplomacy from Morocco. She just joined us in. Uh, Karima, sorry, sorry, uh, we, you had to wait so long. Um, to join in. Okay. Yo. <laughs> Sorry, Karim. I was busy speaking. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Okay. So, uh, okay. so you, you, you see, the, the, the mastery is in ability to listen at the same time, which I missed. Yeah. My apologies. I, I missed uh, almost everything, but, you know, I, I have a quick question. Please. Um, Today, you know, in uh, more specifically, as we are living this uh, specific uh, uh, crisis uh, by COVID-19, I think uh, we have a, a digital transformation that is more accelerated today, and we're speaking more uh, on new leadership styles, uh, executive leadership styles. We're talking now about management 3.0. Probably tomorrow we'll have management point. Uh, uh, 5.0 or even more with well, we these really uh, digital it. transformation. Uh, to what extent the these transformations will be impacting the workforce, more specifically uh, human resources as they are adapting remote work, and also the management styles that need to be adapted to to these new trends that we move into. We now talk, thank you, Karima, thank you very much. We talk now about the digital era, but digital era is a reflection of the knowledge era. A knowledge era started when servant leadership started because we suddenly realized that knowledge is more important, knowledge which is in people is more important than buildings or machines, right? So we can't progress further than our thinking. The machines wouldn't be clever than us, right? And everything is built on human involvement, on human interaction. If we talk about these days, COVID days, uh, I was recently listening to one of the top New York psychologists and she is greatly noted that for instance before March this year an average person in the US was receiving 1,800 messages per month, text messages, SMS, WhatsApp, all kind of messages. Today an average person is receiving 20,000 messages, 11 times more. But the problem is, the majority of these messages are negative. So we could blame technologies instead of blaming ourselves that we are not sharing positive things. We are in a rush to share negative things. <gasps> Something gone wrong. How are you scared? It looks to me you're not scared enough. You should be scared more. What is wrong with technology? Nothing wrong. Thanks to this technology we are talking now. 
So it's our fault to make it non, so non-human. We are making it wrong. In this sense, it's more important to stay really human. And if I do my job, I do my job myself independently at my home office, John Spence himself does the same thing. Terry Jackson does the same thing. Many of us do this job from home for years and we're still connected with people. We still love each other, we still respect each other and we're well communicating. Nothing wrong with this. We're just learning about this. Thank you. Thank you. Th thank you very much, uh, Doctor O. Thank you. Yeah. Um, is that do we have one more? Any question? more questions, please? One more question before we before we run it off. Okay. Uh, from, from, from oh yeah. Ben, ben Silver. Nice, nice to ben have Silver. you. Please go on with your yep. question. Thank yes. you so much. Uh, first of all, I'm sorry for being late to the meeting. I have one question, please. How can we differenti differentiate between the you and individualism, especially and individualism? Because when we focus of, on the you, sometimes we focus more on, uh, on the individualism, what we call individualism, especially when we lead an organization or a community. Maybe I am more focus focusing or, uh, on online communities. So how, please, we can make this differentiation between two, between the you and being more... People servant. Have, uh, yeah, I don't know how to say it. Maybe Karima can, uh, can help me. Uh, uh, in French, we say ego. Yeah, ego. It's ah, in it's languages, yeah. it's the same. Yeah. The, there are few interesting words in this Thank world you. which are the same. Ego, ego, idiots, you know, they're all the same. And thank you very much for a great question. And what I just learned, leaders, this, uh, we have pleases. They're trying to please everyone. So they're making everything on consensus, which wouldn't lead anyone far. We have people who are driven by personal ambitions. They will drive a company and people off a cliff without blinking an eye, which is dangerous, right? This is where me stands above everything. But today we talk about servant leadership, or even I'm just working on a visionary leadership where everything depends what I do for people. Because it's not about me, it's about people. If I have a vision, that means I envisioning how to create value for people. If I have my personal ambitions, that means I only could see how I create value only for myself. Yes, the problem is that there are not enough today leaders with really strong understanding that they are they have a privilege to lead people, not to rule people. That's a problem. But if we expect or we're aiming for a good result, we must help people grow. They will make this result. Thank you. All right, great. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming on board this evening. Uh, this is absolutely true <laughs> for those of you in Canada and in, and in the U.S. and other part of the world. We thank you so much. So we're, we're going to end this today. Um, tomorrow we are having Dr. Jackson, and he will be speaking on um, building a productive team and customer experience. Dr. Jackson will be up tomorrow, same time, same time here and then. Just prepare your questions about um, building a productive team and customer experience. What is it? What are the challenges about 
um, the experiences you are giving to your customers, to your clients, any question you have on customer experience and building a productive thing, just prepare your questions and then we'll tackle them tomorrow. Yeah, and also we'd like to apologize for all those that uh, couldn't, uh, couldn't come in. Um, we didn't inform Dr. O that he was the host, so he was supposed to allow people to come in, so he didn't know it's not his fault. Uh, so we're going to have more people tomorrow. We had almost uh, 40 people waiting to come in. Unfortunately, some of them turned off because they couldn't come in. So we'll have more, more people tomorrow. Uh, it's going to be an exciting, another exciting day tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, please stay safe. Uh, we love you all. We don't want anything to happen to any of you. We want to continue to see you, you know, and also we hope that all this will come to an end very soon so that I can see you, I can shake your hand, I can hug you, I can give you a peck. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Okay, um, you have, you have you know, you. a final word, final word before we go? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you. So see you tomorrow. See you tomorrow. Same time. Stay positive. That's the main thing. See you tomorrow. Yeah. Take care. Take care. Thank you. Bye.